had. Whatever it was that was going to happen to this goat was something that people came by helicopter to see. We trotted on, numb and light-headed, suddenly finding meaningless things to laugh wildly and hysterically at, as if we were walking willfully towards something that would destroy us as well. Leading from the helipad was a yet more formal pathway. It was a couple of yards wide, with a stout wooden fence along either side about two feet high. We followed this along for a couple of hundred yards, until we came at last to a wide gully about ten feet deep. And here there were a number of things to see. To our left was a kind of bandstand. Several rows of bench seats were banked up behind each other, with a sloping wooden roof to protect them from the sun and other inclemencies in the weather. Tied to the front rail of the bandstand were both ends of a long piece of blue nylon rope, which ran out and down into the gully, where it was slung over a pulley wheel, which hung from the branches of a small bent tree. A small hook hung from the rope. Stationed around the tree, basking in the dull light of a hot but overcast day, and in the stench of rotten death, were six. Large, muddy grey dragon lizards. The largest of them was probably about ten feet long. It was at first quite difficult to gauge their size. We were not that close as yet. The light was too blear and grey to model them clearly to the eye, and the eye was simply not accustomed to equating something with the shape of a lizard with something of that size. I stared at them a while, aghast, until I realised that Mark was tapping me on the arm. I turned to look. On the other side of the short fence, a large dragon was approaching us. It had emerged from the undergrowth, attracted no doubt by the knowledge that the arrival of human beings meant that it was feeding time. We learnt later that the group of dragons that hang out in the gully rarely go very far from it, and now do very little at all other than lie and wait to be fed. The dragon lizard padded towards us, slapping its feet down aggressively. First, its front left and back right, then vice versa, carrying its great weight easily and springily with the swinging, purposeful gait of a bully. Its long, narrow, pale, forked tongue flickered in and out, testing the air for the smell of dead things. It reached the far side of the fence and then began to range back and forth. Tetchily waiting for action, swinging and scraping its heavy tail across the dusty earth. Its rough, scaly skin hung a little loosely over its body, like chainmail, gathering to a series of cowl-like folds just behind its long death's head of a face. Its legs were thick and muscular, and ended in claws such as you'd expect to find at the bottom of a brass table leg. The thing is just a monitor lizard. And yet it is massive to a degree that is unreal. As it rears its head up over the fence and around as it turns, you wonder how it's done, what trickery is involved. At that moment, the party of tourists began to straggle towards us along the path, cheery and unimpressed, wanting to know what was up, what was happening. Oh, look, there's one of those dragons. Oh, it's a big one, nasty-looking fella. And now, the worst of it was about to begin. At a discreet distance behind the bandstand, the goat was being slaughtered. Two park guards held the struggling, bleating creature down on the ground with its neck across a log and hacked its head off with a machete, holding the bunch of leafy twigs against it to staunch the eruption of blood. The goat took several minutes to die. Once it was dead, they cut off one of its back legs for the dragon behind the fence. Then took the rest of the body and fastened it onto the hook on the blue nylon rope. It rocked and swayed in the breeze as they winched it down to the dragons lying in the gully. The dragons took only a lethargic interest in it for a while. They were very well-fed and sleepy dragons. At last, one reared itself up, approached the hanging carcass, and ripped gently at its soft underbelly. A great muddle of intestines slipped out of the goat and flopped over the dragon's head. They lay there for a while, steaming gently. 
The dragon seemed, for the moment, not to take any further interest. Another dragon then heaved itself into motion and approached. It sniffed and licked at the air, and then started to eat the intestines of the goat from off the head of the first dragon, until the first dragon rounded on it and started to claim part of its meal for itself. At first nip, a thick green liquid flooded out of the glistening grey coils, and as the meal proceeded, the head of each dragon in turn became wet with the green liquid. Boy, this makes it big, Pauline," said a man standing near me, watching through his binoculars. "It makes it bigger than it is. You know, with these, it's the size I really thought we'd be seeing." He handed the binoculars to his wife. "Oh, that really does magnify it," she said. It really is a superb pair of binoculars, Pauline, and they're not heavy either. Other of the group clustered round. May I take a look? Whose are these? My gosh, Howard would adore these. Al, Al, take a look at these binoculars and see how heavy they are. Just as I was making the charitable assumption that binoculars were just a, a diversion from having actually to watch the hellish floor show in the pit, the woman who now had possession of them suddenly exclaimed delightedly. Gulp, gulp, gulp! All gone. What a digestive system! Oh, now he's smelling us. He probably wants fresher meat," growled her husband, live on the hoof. It was, in fact, at least an hour or so before all of the goat had gone, by which time the party had drifted, chatting, back to the village. As they did so, a lone English woman in the party confided to us that she didn't actually care much about the dragons. I liked the landscape," she said airily. "The dragons are just thrown in, and of course all the strings and the goats and the tourists. Well, it's just comedy, really. If you're walking by yourself and you came across one, that might be different. But it's kind of like a puppet show." When the last of them had left, a park guard told us that if we wished to, we could climb down into the gully and see the dragons close to, and with swimming heads we did so. Two guards came with us, armed with long sticks which branched into a Y at the end. They used these to push the dragons' necks away if they came too close or began to look aggressive. We clambered and slithered down the slope, almost too scared to know or care what we were doing. And within a few minutes, I found myself standing just two feet from the largest of the dragons. It regarded me without much interest. Having plenty already to feed on, a length of dripping intestine was hanging from its open jaws, and its face was glistening with blood and saliva. The inside of its mouth was a pale, hard pink, and its fetid breath, together with the hot, foul air of the gully, combined into a stench so overpowering that our eyes were stinging and streaming, and we were half faint with nausea. All that remained by now of the goat which we had followed as it struggled bleating down the pathway ahead of us was one bloody and dismembered leg, hanging by its ankle from the hook on the blue nylon rope. One dragon alone was still interested in it and was gnawing moodily at the thigh muscles. Then it got a proper grip on the whole leg and tried with vicious twists of its head to pull it off the hook. 